Hi, everyone. We'll start in just a couple minutes. We're just going to wait actually a couple seconds. We're going to wait to allow people to come into the room. Okay. Welcome back, everyone, to Teaching Green. Uh, my name is Barbara Weinreich. I'm one of the co-chairs of this event, and I'm the Interim Director of Graduate Programs at NYSED. Um, so we're really excited to do our second of the two uh, Excellence in Sustainable Design case studies. Uh, we just saw green schools, and now we're going to go on to green hospitality design uh, with two luminaries in the field. So we're so excited to have them here today. Um, first, I'll introduce Bill Browning, who is, uh, has a BED from Colorado University, uh, is honorary lead AP. He's one of the green building and real estate industry's foremost thinkers and strategists and an advocate for sustainable design solutions at all levels of business, government, and civil society. In 2006, he founded Terrapin Bright Green, LLC, an environmental strategies research and consulting firm. Um, Bill's clients include Disney, New Songo City, Lucasfilm, Google, Bank of mm -hmm. America, the White House, Interface, and the Sydney 2000 Olympic Athletes Village. He is a founding board member of the USGBC, and I'm also proud to say that he is on the advisory board of the MPS and Sustainable Environments here um, at NYSED, and was also on our advisory board for this symposium. Um, he is joined by his friend and colleague, Lorraine Francis. Uh, Lorraine is the principal for Cadiz Collaboration and has worked in hospitality industry for over 20 years, leading and setting design direction for a multitude of hotel projects. At her previous firm, Gensler, which some of you may have heard of, mm -hmm. she was the regional director of hospitality interiors for five years and an integral member of Gensler's regional and firm-wide hospitality practice area. Lorraine brings to her work a large breadth of interior and architectural project expertise working with major hotel and boutique hotel chains like Marriott, the Luxury Collection, Cambria Hotels, Bellamar Hotel, Tova Hotel, and Zantera Resorts. Currently, she's working on several new ground up hotels with expected grand openings in 2021 and 22 for Cambria Hotels in Napa, Sonoma, Santa Clara, Austin, and Pleasant Hill, and high-end luxury residences in Orange County and LA. Uh, she recently completed a research pro passion project, Biophilic Design, the ROI for the guest experience in collaboration with Terrapin Bright Green and Interface. Other research includes effects of Airbnb and hospitality, textile performance and design science, and currently focusing on sleep wellness and hospitality. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Bill and Lorraine. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Barbara. Happy to be here. Yes, happy to be here. Thank you. Good. So I think kind of, um, I think Bill, I think kind of, you know, Bill and I have known each other for quite a while, over 10 years, and we've done a lot of research and speaking together. So a little bit of this was to actually kind of do case studies, but I think we also should talk about kind of some of the work that we've done together. And as a designer and architect, you know, how we use biophilic design kind of as a, one of our principles for kind of our design and kind of incorporating sustainability into our process. Um, so I think I'll kind of go through some introductions first and then Bill, I think talking about the patterns will be great. And then we'll go into the case studies and then we'll actually talk about a great project um, with MindClick as one of kind of our assessment tools and kind of like that as a learning tool. So, um, so I think always that this whole thing with biophilic design, you probably have had it, Bill, is kind of like everyone gets confused on what biophilic design is and what biomimicry is. And I heard um, Tetsu earlier today with biomimicry and really talking about that as wisdom from nature. And I think, you know, from my learnings from um, actually Bill, kind of biophilia as being, you know, from the Greek word, love of life, and really our connection with nature. And I think kind of Bill and I have over in the past done a lot of speaking at, um, you know, BDNY and HD Expo over the years. And we love to do this one exercise at the beginning. And I think if I could ask all of you permission just for like 30 seconds of your time, I know you guys have had a busy day, but I think if you could ask permission just to close your eyes just for 30 seconds. And I think it's just about like taking a breath and recalibrating ourselves and just quieting our mind. And I think that idea is like, taking a breath in. And I think sometimes we're running so fast that like we just breathe to our chest and like taking that breath in all the way to your belly. And just for a second, just relax. 
And I think just, you know, if you close your eyes and really think of a place that brings you a sense of joy, a sense of peace, um, you know, I just want you, everyone to start visualizing because we're all designers here and stuff. Um, so visualizing what it might look like, um, what it might feel like, what it might smell like, and what it might taste like, or the taste in the air. So, and also kind of the idea of sound. I think it's kind of always using your senses in a sense of design. And I think if we all just stop for a second and then open our eyes and kind of think what that place is, um, we love this exercise. So if I open my eyes when I've done this before, um, kind of our next slide, um, mine is actually on the left and I have like a small, very little small lavender farm up in Hood River, Oregon. But I think it just brings me this kind of sense of nature and connection and the purple and the smell and kind of this beautiful walnut tree. And then we have this like rolling hills around us and a couple of cows that I go out to that we have. Um, but I think kind of when we do this exercise, you know, we realize that 90% of the time people think about a place in nature and they don't really think about, you know, joy and peace is like the rooftop deck and kind of a place in New York City. And I'm going to let Bill talk about his place that he envisions when he kind of does this exercise. So this is uh, an old uh, coconut plantation in Phuket in uh, Thailand, and this is the original Amman resort. And so I'm looking from one of the villas, little villas here. <laughs> Uh, out across the pool, out to the Ottoman Sea. And you can smell the, the smell of the salt water and you can hear the waves crashing on the beach down below this. Uh, and you have this amazing prospect view out through this uh, extraordinary setting. Yeah. No, and I think kind of why this is important to like Bill and us is kind of, you know, just looking up some new stats, but, you know, like in 1800, only 3% of the population lived in the city. You know, and I think in 2007 or 2008, we really crossed to 50-50 living in the city and the country. And one of our case studies that we'll talk about from some of our research is the, um, the Park Hotel in Singapore. But I think this idea, this connection to nature is and biophilic design is so important is because, you know, those stats like in 2030, I think that's supposed to be 60%. Um, and if we think about, you know, the population by then will be about 5 million or 10 million. So it's going to be 5 million billion people are living in the city. So I think that is really kind of this major principle of biophilic design and how we're gonna live moving forward and embracing sustainability. So I'm gonna kind of, you know, pass the baton to you, Bill, and I think I'll just go through the slides when you could kind of wanting to and kind of looking at, you know, your research in Turp and Bright Green over the years. One of the things that we've done looking at different experiences of nature and how they impact people and, and how do we categorize all of them? And we find that they fit into three broad categories. The first are direct connections, experiences of nature, which we call nature in the space. The second is natural analogs, which are representations of nature. And the third are spatial conditions. We wrote a, a publication called The 14 Patterns of Biophilic Design. And we recently, in the process of writing a new book, Nature Inside, for the Royal Institute of British Architects, added a 15th pattern, which is the experience of awe. And so this is different than a traditional pattern language and then it's not a set of objects, but it's more a set of experiences that you encode into your design. Next. Does it make a difference? Well, even just in hospitality, um, you, know, you always hear, oh, well, room with view costs more. And so we kind of asked that question, does it cost more? And we could only find, uh, and working with our friends at the hospitality school at Cornell, we could only find one paper that had been written on a view costing more. And it was two hotels uh, on the lake in Lucerne in, in Switzerland. And half the rooms had a view to, to the lake and the other half had a view to the, um, to the city, same rooms and the Lakeview ones were higher priced. That wasn't a big enough data set. So we did an exercise, it's still kind of big back of the envelope where we booked rooms in a hundred hotels around the world. And we booked, we used hotels.com because they had the most uh, thorough descriptions of the rooms. And we would break the same room with a view and without a view for the same three nights and look at the difference in prices and take it all the way through the booking so we actually got the price. And what we found was that in resort hotels, which were half of the set, 
Um, water views were 16% more. Garden or other were just slightly more, but the, the view to water was what really drove up the price. In the urban setting, view to a park or garden was about 2% more, uh, but view to water or a famous landmark uh, was about 12% more. So this is a, a sort of economic example of we already are paying for biophilia, even though this, you know, most people wouldn't say, oh, biophilia. This actually is an ex economic example of hospitality already capturing biophilic design. Next. Yeah, no, and I think kind of just, you know, you know, doing this research and kind of interface sponsoring it was so great. And I think as a designer and working with Bill and Terrapin and his whole group, it was really kind of a new vocabulary to do as a return on investment and talk about to the client of why we had to do certain things in the lobby or why we had to do certain materiality. So I think kind of this research and quantifying it have been quantified in schools and have been quantified in hospitals and have quantified in offices, but no one had really quantified in hospitality. And that's why it was so important to our industry and to actually talk about this and kind of really having a return on investment for a developer conversation and making decisions and choices moving forward. I'll go to the next one. So this is an example of trying to apply that. Um, so Weston, uh, the internal design team at Weston picked up our 14 patterns of bio design <clears throat> and decided to use them to help to think resetting lobbies in various hotels. On the right and in the small image um, is the Weston peach tree, which has this dramatic atrium in the core, uh, which is all concrete and uh, skylit and really dramatic, but it felt a little intimidating and um, people would travel through it, but not necessarily spend a lot of time in it. And so rethinking it, um, creating these little spaces using the screens with biomorphic forms and uh, painting the core wall with a super graphic of uh, a local magnolia and bringing these elements of nature into the space changed the use patterns of that. After that, subsequently, uh, Marriott decided to reset the design and think of a new prototype for the guest rooms using biophilic design as part of that experience to go beyond just the heavenly bed and that wellness experience of the bed to extend that to the entire room. And so one of those elements is using uh, a statistical fractal, using uh, the pattern of dynamic and diffuse light plus complexity and order. This is a perforated metal screen with LEDs behind it that creates this light pattern on the ceiling. You see it on the walls, you see it on the floor. And we know that when you experience a statistical fractal like this, almost instantaneously, you get a calming effect. You'll see galvanic skin uh, changes. You'll see changes in blood pressure and heart rate. It really calms you down. So imagine after you've had a stressful day, particularly at night, you come in and you open your room and the first thing you see is this amazing, beautiful dappled light and you just calm down even as you're just coming into the room. Yeah, I love that example, Bill. It really is kind of beautiful. Um, Good. So I think kind of moving forward, we're actually going to go into um, just the different spaces of a hotel from the lobby to the spa to guest rooms and everything. Um, and then we'll go through um, probably like six different case studies. Um, but I think kind of first we want to talk about um, what we can use and what we kind of do as kind of our guiding principles. And it's our guiding principle for all our projects, you know, so I think, you know, and first off, you know, all of you designers. So the key is number one is form and function. So if a, if a hotel or a space doesn't work, if we don't get the form, um, the planning done right, then we haven't done our job. So that's first and foremost before we kind of add all these other lenses to the design to make things more sustainable and make things more, um, you know, wellness factors. And so, so the second lens, you know, working with Bill and really kind of using his patterns is really kind of using a biophilic lens on top of our form and function. And I think, you know, the framework you created, Bill, with the patterns really kind of helps us to look at different parts of the space in different ways. Um, kind of a third lens we use, and I think with hotels, it's a little bit hard to always get a lead accredited hotel and get, you know, a beautiful plaque on your building. And it's just because of the nature of the developer world, sometimes they might sell a property within five years or only keep it. So we don't always get that return on investment. So a client might not want to spend 
$50,000, extra $100,000 extra to go through that process. But we like to still do it as a checklist for all our projects. So we look at LEED, BD plus C, you know, as kind of our project checklist. Um, we look at well, and we're doing a lot of projects in California. So California Green, you know, you know, we have very good mechanical, you know, performance um, on Title 24, just because the codes in Cal California. And then also we'll talk as a case study later a little bit about MindClick and kind of that being a different assessment tool that we can use in terms of ff &E and furniture that's not always you know cataloged in lead so i think that's kind of another thing that's important as designers interior designers um kind of a fourth principle that we use in listening to jennifer graham this morning from perkins and will was kind of that whole human-centric design so and kind of you know obviously wellness and you know has been a big buzzword since the pandemic and kind of covid but we've been thinking about it for years but I think what we love about the idea of hospitality, um, it really is your home away from home and kind of having a well experience. And I think, you know, younger millennial travelers, you know, it's like they want to take their well and their fitness to the hotel, to their home away from home. And how do we incorporate that? Um, and fifth, I think it's really kind of a story of place. And I think all of our um, properties and projects we work on, we really do a lot to be inclusive. So and I think when we look at inclusivity, we look at it in terms of community, we look at it in terms of place and really kind of, you know, we don't want to just dump a hotel, you know, in, you know, Sahara Desert and be a tropical hotel, it doesn't make any sense. So if we're not connect, connecting to the story of place and using materiality that is connected to that, you know, then we're not doing our job right. And I think also with community, it comes down to people. And I think staff, you know, if you think about what keeps a hotel developer at night, it's really the cost of his, you know, energy and then, all, you know, expenses and then also staff. And obviously with the staffing shortage right now, you know, your staff and your back of house and front of house, you know, relating is really important. Um, and I think six of the design principle, like we always believe in this growth mindset and kind of being relevant and research. And I think kind of, you know, that's always critical to always be learning. And I think these type of symposiums that, um, you know, NICE puts on is really critical to both, you know, young designers coming up in the field, but also for professionals to kind of learn from each other and being transparent and moving forward in that. So I think just kind of using that as kind of these six principles that we're going to kind of see within these different projects as we move forward. And so we'll go back on one more on that, and that's this idea yeah. of community. You know, hotel lobbies, if you look at the history of hotels, the hotel lobby, <laughs> up until the 1950s, 1960s, most hotel lobbies were the living room of the community, right? They weren't just serving the um, hotel guests, but they served a really important function within the larger communities where you went to meet friends and met together. And over time, um, we lost that and hotels just became this vast, the uh, lobbies, these vast sort of wasted spaces that were transactional. You checked in, you checked out, you waited for your luggage or your car to come and that was it. And many brands are rethinking that in a very dramatic way and thinking about how uh, these experiences shift. And so one of those is this one on the right, which is uh, one of the Citizen M hotels. Citizen M uses modular construction to create rooms that are no wider than the bed itself. They're, they're beautifully, extraordinarily beautifully designed. But the idea is that um, you have these micro rooms and then you have this extraordinary social space um, that uh, allows interaction uh, in a really, really extraordinary way. Yeah, no, and I think actually with your um, kind of the 15 patterns, that whole like prospect and refuge and mystery, you know, in this citizen, and I stayed there the first time I was in New York for a, for a while, but it really just has this two layers, you know, and kind of this, you know, in a small space, it really creates all that kind of, you know, and a little bit of sense of awe, which is so great within this actually example. It's not one of our projects, but we use it as one of our examples with our research because it really does a great job. And I think even this with the staff, you know, I think what I love about Citizen M is kind of like, you know, all their staff members are ambassadors and kind of they might have a staff member that will work housekeeping for a month and then be at the front desk, you know, the next month and maybe be the bartender. 
So I think that also equality of that and inclusivity of that and kind of changing. So it's not like you just have the housekeepers here and you have the bartenders, F and B people here and the front desk people really helps connect the guests with actually the staff and the locality of it to kind of be able to ask that fun question of where is a really great place to go. So I think that they do a really great job with all of that. Um, I think just with these guest rooms, you know, we talked about the room with the view and that was kind of part of the study that we did. And this bottom left, we'll talk more in detail, <clears throat> but this is also about, you know, when you don't have a view, you know, how do you actually create, you know, a room on a budget and also have it feel like it's connected to nature. And I think we kind of talk about this a little bit later, um, Bill, in terms of some of the materiality. Um, spa and wellness, we kind of do a lot of, you know, spas individually, but I think kind of that spa and wellness is really important to our every day. So even though these are specific spas, um, the bottom left is um, one we did for the Gila Indian River community um, or Gila River Indian community, which is Pima and Maricopa Indians and really kind of having a sense of story and place of healing and well-being that we incorporated it. and it's like along this beautiful river. So this, you know, the carpet here is actually like the reeds of the river, um, uh, the plants along the river. So that was kind of a beautiful way that we brought that in. And then obviously hotels have a lot of different restaurants and food is such a, you know, a nourishing aspect of, you know, traveling. Um, so these, the one on the left and the top are actually one we did with actually the five elements. So the center top is actually the earth room um, connecting. So we did the tree, you know, and kind of the root structure being above you. Um, the left one is the fire room. And I think actually the bottom center one, I think I actually called Bill when I was sitting here having breakfast um, a month ago, but it's actually a public hotel in New York and they redid the Peruvian restaurant. And, um, and it really was, you know, because I think sometimes when people talk about green hotels, it's like about having a green wall and sticking a lot of green stuff on the wall. And obviously that's not it, but I think this hotel did it really well. And I think having dinner there that evening, like I feel like I had to touch three times like the wall to kind of see that these were, weren't real plants. Like they did it such a great job, but I think it was great because it was such a hot day in New York. And then when you kind of went here and they had this exquisite food, I think this kind of ambience that they created really made you feel good and connected. And it wasn't so much that there was all this green stuff around, but this was just like a great way to do it with the food presentation that really enhanced the experience. So that was a good one. Um, so I think kind of moving forward, we're just going to talk about some different case studies. And I think what, um, you know, Bill and I have been on some great panels with Claudine and, you know, Sixth Sense projects, and they're all beautiful and have great budgets. And we've been a little bit more restricted. You know, we've had some tight budgets. Cambria is a great, like, upcoming um, boutique hotel brand. And we've been trying to help tell their story of what's their differentiator. So this is one that hasn't started construction, but it's in Silicon Valley, which is obviously, you know, high tech, Google complex, everything is over there. And really, we were trying to create a story and Big Basin, um, um, the Redwood Forest Park, which is actually the first state park in California, is very close. And specifically in Big Basin, there are actually um, these redwood trees that are a certain species that are really the tallest in the world. And we really kind of thought, like, how do we bring, it's almost like, um, you know, a thousand years ago, which is kind of like these redwood trees were, you know, first up and growing, and then kind of a thousand years in the future being in Silicon Valley and the future of that. So I think we kind of thought that would be a great story to kind of tell and that sense of like awe and reverence that you do get when you feel like you're in the forest and you feel small, but you feel connected to nature. So how do we kind of bring that? And I think just thinking about like, you know, people are traveling here from all over the world um, to talk about technology, you know, how do we create this, um, you know, respite for them at the end of the day to connect to the community, to connect to their business colleagues in a space that was kind of indoor outdoor um this bottom right kind of uses this wall that we were going to kind of this um you know kind of just very linear wall kind of like the um, redwood forest and then also the bottom of the forest you know it's like, like ferns grow so we were using these like clear lucite and then kind of doing this kind of fern growing on it behind this wall so just doing it in a modern context rather than just doing a green wall but kind of still tying the elements and then we just brought in the idea of you know an old lodge, but kind of modernizing. And um, with Cambria, we actually always have to do have a pop of color. So there's these beautiful banana slugs that are, you know, giant and yellow. So we brought in kind of yellow as kind of our color that was going to be within the guest rooms and everything. So that was a really fun um, way to kind of connect things. 
Um, Temple Tensor project we're working on right now. It's also a Cambria. It's in central coast of California. Um, half of our client, fifty percent client, actually owns a ranch up there, and um, and there's something just beautiful that's different about Templeton with these rolling hills and these these oak trees that are there. And actually, there's a beautiful like fog that happens in Templeton um, that doesn't happen actually in different parts of the California coast. And that's actually why the wine has actually been kind of a growing um, um, environment over there and kind of having a lot of wineries. But I think we actually create this whole idea because our client, um, this was kind of a big ranch. So we actually modernizing the word of Rancho. So it's, uh, it's modern Rancho. Um, and I think Rancho was always that whole idea about hospitality, like you might have ranches that are, you know, 50 miles apart, and whoever came to your ranch, you had to let them in the door and give them water and make sure their horses were okay. So we wanted to really embrace that into this um, project and really honor kind of our client and his ranch, um, you know, history, but also creating this really great indoor outdoor space and kind of, um, you know, our outdoor space is actually larger than our indoor space. So that whole idea of connecting to nature was really important. But also a place where that whole idea when you are on a ranch, it's like you kind of slow your roll and you kind of like connect up and you actually talk to people. And I think their ranch is really based on family and kind of, you know, how they have the wine and how they have their, you know, their cows and everything that they're doing ranching there. So we wanted to kind of bring that kind of story into the space and just even being fun with like, you know, these hay bales. I haven't figured out how we're going to do that and kind of how we're going to keep them and kind of tying them into the front reception desk, but kind of, you know, having these fun elements that are a ranch, but not, but also not bastardizing it. And not, it's not about just like sticking a bunch of, you know, horse, you know, saddles around the place. So I think that was kind of the whole idea that, you know, people are, you know, not ranchers, but how do you kind of bring that aesthetic into it and into a certain materiality of what we're using in natural materials and wood floor and this kind of, you know, this wood ceiling and this black metal. So those are aspects of it. Um, the Bellamar Hotel is actually a hotel that's actually in um, Manhattan Beach. And there's actually only one hotel kind of on the water in Manhattan Beach. And Manhattan Beach has a great, you know, pier, it has great sand, great water over there. Maybe not today with some things going on on the West Coast, <laughs> some oil stuff. Um, but I think it was also like, so how do we take this kind of smaller boutique hotel that was really dark and kind of, you know, just not really didn't feel like you were at the beach at the hotel. And we just had a very small budget. So it was kind of bringing these elements of uh, we work with interface on kind of a carpet tile for this room, but creating these like elements of the sand and how the sand is different. So these actually were great from interface because actually had nub and texture. And I think Bill, you and I talked about earlier about, you know, wood and these textures on kind of our eyes and how we see things and how it does kind of calm our senses when we're connected to these textures in a very simple environment, a neutral environment. So it was really about enhancing that. So we're currently working on compiling some research on that impact of the wood grain and similar grain like you see in the sand, uh, like this carpet pattern. And what we're finding from the neuroscientists, that, uh, particularly at Sulk, is that when we see these sort of collinear patterns that have a little bit of movement to them, but uh, so not perfectly parallel, but have iteration and variation in them, um, it's group set of neurons that process that. And so it's actually much easier for the brain to interpret the environment. And that has a really powerful uh, calming effect on us. Yeah, no, it's great. But I think really, you know, this, you know, the statement here enhancing the guest experience through biophilic design is really, you know, how we try to do that kind of on a low budget and understanding textures and space and where we can make impact go. Um, the Long Beach Hotel, this is actually um, kind of a feasibility study for us, um, a competition. And actually, um, they're both, there's two different designs on the left and the right, but I think the left one really shows um, kind of a client wanted to use Long Beach meets South Beach. So we really kind of thought about how do you use um, a digital platform and also, you know, this is a conference hotel. So also how do you change the experience of people traveling, you know, in the morning they're going to the conference and when they finish at the end of the day, they want to come to a more hip hotel at the end of the day. So we kind of had this idea of like, you know, when you drive down South Beach, you know, in a convertible, there's something so amazing with all of the palm trees above you. So how can we create that look and sort of this runway idea in a digital aspect and still have a sense of water on this carpet? 
but then also the beauty of Long Beach, it's kind of like there's a harbor and there's like those twinkle lights. So kind of that whole night thing about like, you know, there's so many boats out there right now, but how do we kind of like look at that? And you see those lights at night from Catalina and like down south to, you know, Palos Verdes and down to Laguna Beach. So that was kind of an interesting way to think about it as a concept. And then our right concept, which is the same space as the left space, was kind of that whole idea of being underwater and kind of that almost that awe of being underwater and kind of having this kind of curved space and kind of the softness that would kind of bring in this California beach feeling in this very, you know, kind of corporate um, conference hotel. So it's just kind of looking at different spaces and this back wall of uh, on the right side, we were just going to have it's kind of like that, you know, that shimmer on the water when it's moving at sunset and kind of like that sound of it. So that was going to be part of the experience on a, you know, on a sound basis. We're looking at the tones of that. Um, the Phoenician Hotel is actually kind of an interesting project. We were the architect interior designer um, on that luxury collection for about 10 years, maybe 12 years. Um, but this is one of the projects we did, a, like a $50 million ballroom that was attached to the hotel. And it was kind of like we had the hotel, we had Camelback Mountain on the back, and then we had a golf course and we had a parking lot. So it was kind of squeezing a giant ballroom into this. Um, but I think also, um, when people think about the desert, they think about it as one type of desert and like the desert in, you know, at Joshua Tree in California is very different than the, the desert that's actually at, you know, at the Fish in Scottsdale, which is very different than the desert in New Mexico. And I think here, like Camelback Mountain is like the most sacred mountain in Arizona, the Hohokam Indians, you know, had this cave on the back that they did all these ceremonies, but I think the beauty of Camelback Mountain, it does have all these um, saguaros um, cacti. And I think, you know, we've done a ton of research on the sorrel cactus and um, it's a little picture of it in the bottom right, but it takes like 50 years for it to actually grow its first little arm. And I think when you research that, it's really a harsh environment, like it has a symbiotic relationship with actually the Palo Verde it kind of shades it while it's kind of growing. And if you look at actually um, the flowers of a sorrel, it's like this white blossom and it actually has the most stamen in the world because it's like only open for a short period of time. So kind of on the left, we brought this abstract of actually the, the blossom and Laddie Day, who's an artist in Venice, he kind of did this kind of panel. So it's kind of just that whole idea. It's not in your face that we're going to put all these flowers around, but it's sort of this connection. And even the carpet, it was kind of this acatillo, which are kind of these like, you know, beautiful um, plants that grow out there that have this little red flower. So it was kind of looking at the spikes of that and how we brought like even the, you know, the ridges of the saguaro into the columns in the conference room and kind of had these big fixtures. So it was kind of like tying that in, but making it like, you know, connected and the stone and kind of really, you know, accentuating the mountain with these kind of layers of how we kind of had the building architecture move through. So it was just kind of a little blend of all of that. And I think kind of <clears throat> lastly, we have um, the Cambria Sonoma <clears throat> and we opened this last year and I'm actually going to not go more into pictures of it, but I think this is where we um, I've known Joanna, she's uh, the founder of MindClick, and um, they have a new tool, and we kind of talked about kind of that six aspect of our design principles is like growth and mindset and tools, but they have an assessment tool. So we did it a little backwards. So we actually just assess the Cambria Sonoma in the past two weeks, and we probably would have done this earlier in the process to see, but I think her, the spirit is like empowering environmental and social leadership through change. So, um, so they actually interview and kind of have a whole, you know, database of incredible companies um, that they really do some deep dive assessments on those companies and really to understand the products, to understand their, you know, you know, what they're doing for waste, what they're doing for after life cycle. So, and they go through this extensive um, rating system. So they have the achiever, um, the leader, and also the starter. So our project, I'm just putting the red square, um, you know, without doing too much, we had 137 points and we we're achiever. Of course, we would like to be a leader, but we didn't do it you know, two years ago when we designed it. So, but I think it was also very foretelling for us to kind of understand like, oh, well, we could, what could we be doing better? Who could we talking to? How do we learn more? How do we use their database to understand things better? But overall, this is kind of a little bit of the synopsis um, from them doing the research over the past um, two weeks when we, we gave them all our FF and E specs, we gave them all our specifications, our interior design set, um, and they kind of aligned it with their database. But 53% of the facilities, um, we had manufacturers that do carbon emissions, achieve higher carbon emissions. Um, you know, 82% of our items had recyclable and harvested, you know, reclaimed material. 
um, you know, they're actually going a little deeper dive into making sure the companies, you know, don't have, you know, child forced labor and also discrimination. And they're kind of taking that to a new level next year with some kind of, um, you know, different other um, assessments that they're working on. And then also kind of looking at end of use um, solutions of what happens, you know, because usually hotels are renovated in seven years or, you know, pieced together, you know, kind of as they kind of evolve or change brands. So really seeing where does that carpet go? Where is that floor going to go when we're going to, you know, renovate in seven years on a certain cycle? Um, and quickly, you know, everyone could go to MindClick, but I just wanted to also like celebrate them and also give them a synopsis of how they would work if we kind of you know, work with them a little bit earlier. But I think, you know, we sent in all our specifications, they kind of match their vendors, um, you know, they create this report and kind of give us, you know, the score. And I think also when they're doing the reporting at the beginning, if we took them on a concept design or design development, we could have changed some products so that we could actually be in the leader category. And I think for us looking forward is really, how are we gonna use this as a design firm, as a tool to talk to our clients and kind of say, hey, you know, if we do a couple more things here, maybe that's going to cost an extra dollar or not. But if we kind of like, you know, stop to think about it, you know, this could be an important marketing tool for your brand, for your hotel, you know, and also, you know, if you're going to sell your hotel in five, 10 years, you know, that you actually got a, you know, a leader score. So I think that was kind of really important to do. Um, and there's a quick vendor story. So, you know, we use Genesis AC for a lot of our outdoors um, spaces. You know, they use a lot of, you know, bio-based and recyclable material. So they are, they're an achiever um, for our meeting room space for both this project and for Napa, we use MTS seating. And I think kind of this also, you know, some of these projects are not done on this giant budget, but I think if we know that MTS versus, you know, ABC firms have a leader score, you know, we're going to be more prone to like, okay, how do we get MTS in this project? Because it's going to help us to have a better score, being able to achieve, you know, sustainability on a higher level. And Shaw, we also love, you know, first performing function. So they do some beautiful designs with us. We work with them. Um, even a lot of our patterns for um, Cambria, um, Sonoma, and Napa were based on kind of a 40,000 foot of, um, you know, of the agrarian landscape there. And that was kind of some of our inspiration for some of our design. But they also do a great product. You know, they, you know, get rid of a ton of waste and they're really kind of a forward thinking company. So really a true leader and kind of, you know, growing our relationship with them as we kind of develop more projects. And I think just kind of, you know, I mean, I think we all kind of know the design process, but, you know, concept design and design development, I think we will kind of work with MindClick on an earlier basis to really look at our FF and E and our specifications to, to do that. So I think we're just going to talk about, I'm going to have Bill talk about a little bit more Park Royal at the end, but I think kind of for me, um, for closing, I think I was listening to um, David and Tetsu talk a little earlier about optimism, and I think with kind of, you know, green and sustainability, it could seem overwhelming, and I think, you know, I look at myself and one of my core values is optimism. So um, I think it's just for all the designers out there to also really understand that you really matter and your design choices matter and they do have an impact. And sometimes when you don't think you're making a difference, it is making a difference. So I just wanna kind of empower all of you to, you know, to step up and know that you matter and get really clear on your design principles and having those conversations with your clients to show them and educate them with all these tools that are really out there to support you and to grow as designers. So I appreciate that and thank you. And then I'll let um, Bill talk about Park Royal. So in the, in the course of doing research on hospitality and, and uh, biophilia and economic performance, one of the hotels that we really got to know is the Park Royal and Pickering in Singapore, designed by Woha. And the, this is really an exploration of how do we bring experiences in nature throughout the fabric of the design. And so you'll see um, use of incredible biomorphic forms. You'll see uh, water features, uh, even in the corridors. And uh, then you'll see these sky gardens, which are cantilevered off the front of the hotel and on surfaces all over the hotel. And in fact, there's so much planted area that the planted area is 2.7 uh, times the actual footprint of the building. So this is a concept called green area ratio. Now, this was not an expensive hotel. 
Um, the Park Royal is a mid-range brand, um, but this one just is so much more successful and such a different experience than all the other Park Royals that they actually rebranded it to create a new brand called the Park Royal Collection. And this is the first hotel of it. Um, the occupancy has been extraordinary and the room rates have gone up three times uh, since it first opened. And uh, just a really fabulous example of thinking through green design, but also from a biological standpoint. Uh, they have done on this and a couple of other projects in downtown Singapore, they've had biologists come in and do a biological survey um, of the biodiversity on the site, not just the plants, but the insects and the birds uh, and other animals on the site. And then found that actually the hotel has a higher level of biodiversity than a block long park that's directly across the street. That's amazing. <laughs> I didn't know that. Uh, next. I think that's the last one. That's yeah, fun. but I think also, awesome. yeah, but I think kind of going back to earlier talking about, you know, by 2030, you know, 60% of the population is going to live in the city. And if our population is going up to 10 million, you know, then that's 5 million people. So I think kind of, you know, this park world is such a great example of really looking at cities in the future and how do you create these diverse environments, you know, to support kind of our connection to nature. Yeah, and one other example I'd love to give of uh, Woha's work, um, which is not hospitality, but it's low income housing and seniors housing on top of government offices and retail in downtown Singapore, a project called the Admiralty on Kan Prum. Uh, and it is um, using the same strategy to create a multi-level garden, multiple floors in, in the sky uh as a uh social housing project it's really quite an extraordinary space yeah so if you don't mind um i'm just jumping in here are you are you guys done with what you okay so this wasn't exactly what i had planned but if you don't mind i might just feed you some questions because i think that'll be easier um so we did have one question so fabulous presentation thank you so thorough and so full of so much information um, so here's a question. Is it possible yet to evaluate hotels per biophilic, quote, health scores? By extension, could one retrofit office spaces for better biophilia, quote, diets for returning workers? So I think it's really about metrics, right? Can, can you, is there a score for health? So there's not a direct scoring system, but there is a way of looking at what the outcomes are based on the science. Uh, and so, in 14 Patterns of Biophilic Design and also in Nature Inside, there's a chart that uh, lists the different patterns and the different sort of physiological and psychological outcomes that have been measured from implementing those different patterns. And so it's a way of doing outcome-based design of saying, okay, if this space is a space that I need to have uh, stress reduction, and these are the patterns that I know will support that outcome. Or if cognitive performance is really important in this space, then these are patterns that will support that. Uh, we've done that research in a mathematics classroom in an inner city school in Baltimore, a year-long study <clears throat> where we literally just used uh, carpet uh, tiles, uh, wallpaper, and um, some window blinds that all had statistical fractals and biomorphic forms on them. And not only did we find through heart rate variability that the stress recovery characteristics in that, care, in that classroom among the students were much better than they were in the control classroom, but we saw a dramatic increase in uh, academic performance in that classroom yeah. as well. And Barbara also, to, you know, Bill's company, Terrapin Bright Green, they have an enormous sense of stuff on their website and everything they share. So kind of our research report, everything, you could go to the website and get all these reports. And I think just going back to, I think one of the first times when I thought about biophilic design, I think it was when you, Bill and I, you and I talked, but it was also, you know, that rate of being in a hospital, you know, so kind of that healing, you know, someone getting a hospital like one and a half days versus three days or whatever, because actually they were next to it near a window and kind of how that healed people faster to get out and to get out of the hospital. So that was kind of, you know, an amazing fact of, you know, when you think about health costs and stuff like that, and then kind of relating that back to hotels and office environments. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm struck by, and we have another question coming up. I'm struck by the amount of like hard data 
that, and I think that must come from Terrapin Bright Green, right? I mean, well, you seem very data driven, right? Like if you can, if you do have the metrics and you have the data, does that make it easier to convince clients or others of outcome? Because, you know, hospitality, it's, you know, return on investment business. So is do, did having those hard facts help you? Yeah, so for instance, on the hotel lobbies, one of the part of the study that Lorraine uh, collaborated with us on uh, and Citizen M was one of the six hotels. We did an observational study of lobby use between hotels that were conventional and had high, and those that had a high biophilic design components. And what we found was that in conventional hotels, 75% of the people were just transitory through the lobby. In the biophilic hotels, we saw a 36% increase in the number of active and passive users. And what that translated to was that people are actually stopping and buying a drink at the bar or getting a coffee or getting a pastry or um, having a glass of wine and talking to their friends. And all of that is including uh, is increasing T Rev par without having to sell another guest room. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, there's an example right there. And in and fact, in the, that Citizen M that you saw the picture of, 56% uh, of the people in the lobby are were active or passive users. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot. And Lorraine, you also mentioned research in your bio about sleep, right? About better sleep patterns um, in hotels. Am I stating that correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, actually, I'm kind of, that's kind of my new little platform on sleep and quality of sleep. And I think, you know, with sitting being, you know, the new smoking, I think the reality of, you know, aging communities and kind of like, you know, I'm not getting eight hours a night. So how do we kind of create that and look at that and look at it also at a hotel and kind of how do we create these more experiential environments on sleep and really supporting the sleep and understanding the studies on that. So we're working with the company um, Down Etc. as one of our companies we work with. They have, you know, amazing sleep products that are in you know millions of hotels in terms of the pillows in terms of understanding cool and temperature so that's kind of a new um speech that we're trying to do for next year with some obviously we got set back with a little bit of um you know the times now so to kind of do more research on that and working with mattress companies and keeping cool and also you know looking at different sheet qualities you know whether you know if we use bamboo but does bamboo take more resources to do so kind of does that make sense you know but kind of if you sleep cooler does that help you out and even looking at um you know binaural beats and kind of you know how your brain waves work and kind of understanding that and maybe those are different things that could plug into a hotel kind of like delos has this wellness floors in a hotel um, you know, and they charge $25 more for that room, would, you know, would a client spend $25 more for a hotel room that is going to support your sleep at a different level? So that's new research we're working on. That's great. Those are actually very specific things to look at that a designer can also consider when they're designing that. And that is, you know, I think what I'm told by hospitality people is that this is very important in the future for, you know, Gen Z and Gen X, it really is important to them that the hotel uh, walk the walk, right? So they'll yeah. go to one hotel over another if they're actually doing these things. So for all of these brands, it's, it's highly important. Great, right, great. Right, right. um, and then here's another question. And then, uh, let's see, no, we're good. Um, in the social justice lens of sustainability and thinking back to the points, um, uh, on front of house, back of house earlier today. Is there anything developing in the hospitality industry that rates brands against standards designed to ensure proper treatment of staff mm -hmm. um, or the impact brands have on environments where they build? Perhaps more of a question abroad, thinking, for example, of resorts in the Caribbean where beaches have been occupied by resorts and employees sometimes work intense hours. This is something that there was an IIDA panel on this, actually, that Jennifer Graham participated in this past year about you know, the, the, and something that um, um, IADA has been working on called Hidden Stories about the sort of hidden inequities of hotels. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the question is, is there anything developing in that industry in hospitality that actually rates hotels per how? I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't know of any rating systems. I think actually talking about transparency, though, I think I heard that earlier was a little bit, you know, back of house staff was back of house staff a little bit before the pandemic. And then because of cleanliness and kind of seeing people out front and making sure they're cleaning, all of a sudden those back of house staff 
came out to the public. So that kind of merge of equality, you know, to see those people, to see that they're taking care of that you're taking care of them, you know, was kind of an interesting thing. I think we just look at it also, you know, because we design back of house spaces. So, you know, you could put LVT or, you know, just like tile and do nothing to it. But if you kind of, you know, bring a little joy to the back of house or whether the back of house bathrooms or storage rooms or, you know, locker rooms and kind of make that experience better for staff. And I think kind of talking about Citizen M, I think they do it really well, kind of calling their staff ambassadors. I think that's a different shift. Um, it's not quantified or it's not a rating system, but I think they took that mindset of bringing this equality to the staff. And I think that made a happier staff member when I've been there and it's been more engaging experience. Yeah, so the, the for us, the most powerful example was the end of the Anasazi, which originally opened in 1991. And it was a hotel that uh, actually did a right livelihood agreement with the hotel staff. And, and they intentionally made in their hiring the in Santa Fe that they had uh, a Latino, uh native american and anglo um employees at all levels of the staff and they had uh wellness programs they had literacy training programs they had a program where staff could volunteer in local uh nonprofits for several hours a week and the hotel would actually pay their salary for that time frame uh, they had dispute resolution training and, in fact, led dispute resolution work for the city of Santa Fe at the hotel. Um, it was just really extraordinary. And so what that translated to was almost no staff turnover, which in hospitality is unheard of. Uh, and in fact, they actually had waiting lists for job openings uh, for the hotel. Um, but because that staff was so motivated, the level of care and interaction that you got from the staff, the cleaning staff through everybody um, was extraordinary. And that translated into a hotel that had 83% occupancy uh, and wound up having the highest room for a while, the highest room rates in Santa Fe because it got so popular. Yeah, it's so interesting. So it's again, the interlocking of equity and sustainability. You know, these are values which are important to this these generations yep. and so they don't they don't separate those two out it's all part of the picture and, and you know in terms of also sustainable practices and the vendors you use and the companies that you associate with all that kind of stuff I think I should to add to that, Ruth, Barbara, quick. Um, so we're friends, both of us are friends with David Leventhal. So he's got a resort um, in Mexico called Playa Viva. And he's actually kind of elaborated on that and actually created this thing called regenerative travel. So, and it was also helping to get all these smaller little ecos to actually have better purchasing power so they can actually, you know, get, you know, a better toilet paper, us recycled content, you know, together. But I think he actually does, I think in his regenerative travel kind of guidelines that it does some measurement on that because like his staff at his resort, Playa Viva, you know, are all local. They use local, you know, ingredients, they, you know, support the town, they use the local gardens. So I think he's trying to build that into more of a global um, practice and resort and qualifications. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a whole regenerative movement in a lot of things, like even in, you know, sustainable real estate development. Um, you know, there are, there are, there are developers out there who are trying to do the right thing also and, you know, understand how that they can build in their communities, um, you know, reasonably and equitably and sustainably. Um, all right, so we just have a couple minutes left and there are a couple questions from, these are sort of more specific. I'm gonna suggest that Stefan buys, buys your book. <laughs> uh, so Stefan Knust is asking, can you say more about lighting and acoustic design trends with respect to health and biophilia? Um, but I, I do wanna give a plug for this book because it, this was, it came out right before the pandemic, right? It was called Biophilia and Interiors. You just mentioned it, I think. Right. Uh, Nature Inside, a biophilic design guide. Uh, it was published last October by the Royal Institute of British Architects. Right. And so, it's specifically on, on biophilic interior design. Right. So, and in fact, you gave a talk about that at NYSED that was like sold out and really very inspirational. So I would recommend that book to, for specifics actually on, on applications and interiors. Um, I think it's really um, well done. All right. So I think that we're just about up with our time. Do you guys have any questions for each other? 
No, thanks for inviting us. And then, yeah, yeah we could send a presentation out to anybody so I could pop it up on um, that file so anyone could download that. And, you know, our contact information is here. If you want to reach out for any questions, you know, we're happy to continue the conversation. So thank you. That's great. Absolutely. Thank you. So thanks for having us. Thank you so much for your time. Bye-bye.